uh, we're, we're going to do some more stuff about AI and, and trying to use it again for the betterment of society, obviously, for this collection at risk. Um, so the title is called Disappearing Acts, uh, Saving 20th Century uh, African Americans Archives in a Moral and Cultural Imperative. Um, so this will be Juliana Richardson from, uh, she's the founder of, of, of History Makers and as well as our very own Hannah Storch from uh, our service division, Pixel Acuity. So Juliana uh, Richardson is a founder and president of the History Makers, the nation's largest African American digital video oral history archive with testimonies of thousands of African American leaders recorded over a 21 year period in 413 cities and towns. The Library of Congress serves as the permanent repository for this unprecedented collection. And Storch is the client success manager with uh, Digital Transitions Pixel Acuity Service Division. Um, she's the uh, leading global provider of sophisticated digitization solutions. She specializes, excuse me, she specializes in cultural heritage digitization and has worked in collections and development at a variety of museums and archives, including the National Museum of National, sorry, Natural History and the National Museum of African Art. Besides image production, image processing, staff supervision, Hannah also creates digitization workflows and programs that optimize productivity and emphasizes preservation. So without further ado, I'll let uh, Juliana start. Uh, <laughs> Well, they're getting uh, things started. I want to say, Doug, that presentation was out of this world, and <clears throat> it was. And it's really um, represents reason that I'm so incredibly grateful uh, for Peter. Um, when you step forward to assist us in the way that you have and the partnership that we are in the journey we're beginning. And I can't say that enough. And I wanna thank Ziv and Caroline and Doug, Mark, who I just met today, and the whole um, uh, Digital Transitions Pixel Cutie family. And are we set? So we're not set, okay, that's okay. So I want to, um, I can start um, just a little bit because of the subject I'm going to talk about, I think about every day, um, and it's disappearing acts. Um, I sit here representing a, a collection that doesn't, does not represent uh, classical cultural heritage. I sit here before you um, with a collection that often has been invisible from view. And, um, and I sit here hoping that each and every one of you in this room and who are all remote, that you will see some way that you can help us because I, we are on a rescue mission against time. I'm terribly afraid of us losing the 20th century of African-American history. Now, I could talk about the, the 19th, the 18th, the 17th centuries that are sort of murky when it comes to the Black experience, but I can tell you right now that within my archives exist a huge amount of history and accomplishments and families and communities that are going to disappear completely if we don't rescue them. So if we, um, yes, sure. Um, I can continue, oh, sorry. Switch sides. Um, a little bit about myself. Um, Peter's right, I'm the founder and president of uh, History Makers, but my background was originally in theater. 
I wanted to be an actress at one time. Um, my father had different views for me. He wanted me to go to Harvard Law School, specifically Harvard Law School. So he went out. Um, but my degree had been in American studies and theater in many ways um, with the history makers. I'm the embodiment of that discipline. So I started the organization 22 years ago at my dining room table. I was without a job. No one would really hire me. I'd have, I have a pretty eclectic background, including having started and run a home shopping network that many in this room go, whoa, screech. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you're a different, but we didn't know you, you were that different. Um, and I say that um, all roads have led me to where I am right now. And um, the last 22 years have been some of the most profound years that a person can live and in, within me resides all this rich and amazing history. Okay. Welcome to use this. There we go. Cool. Yeah. So um, how many of you um, in this room, how many of you know your family background and history? Can I see a show of hands? Because I am. Um, I grew up in okay. Sorry about this. That's okay. Turning the screen over there. Okay. I grew up in a, a small town. I'm born in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, in a, a steel mining town. And um, I grew up until I was age nine in that town. And I'll just um, I'll just continue while they get. Um, so I grew up in this small uh, coal mining town uh, called Duquesne, Pennsylvania. And the only thing that we studied about black people were George Washington Carver. And my teacher said he could do all these things with peanuts. And then there was slavery and you would see people sort of hunched over. That's me at age nine. <laughs> Am I controlling this or? Okay, great. So that's me at age nine. And uh, the my teacher one day asked us to talk about our family backgrounds and Literally, my class, and I'm the only black kid in the class, and everybody's hand goes, she shoots up like arrows. And they're like, I'm part German, I'm part Italian, I'm part, and they even had hyphenates. And I'm just cowering over in the corner, and I'm like, what am I? So I said, maybe Negro, not sure, black. I don't even know if we had words to black at that point. I said Native American because a lot of black people think they have Native American in them. And I added in French because my father had been stationed in France and I didn't want to be left out. <laughs> so the project is a lot about identity formation, where you come from. You know, it's really quite important about identity formation. But also what is important is value validation. And it was in my sophomore year at Brandeis University where I'm studying about the Harlem Renaissance, that I had the privilege to sit in New York Public Library in the Schomburg Library with my headphones on on a fall day, um, <clears throat> listening to I Just Walk About Harry, which was um, a Broadway production uh, written by songwriting team with Noble Sisson and Blake in the 1921 production. And it was like, a thunderbolt with me because I found myself because the song that I associated with President Harry Truman was written by that black songwriting team. And the, the librarian, the famous librarian at the New York Schomburg Library, Jean Blackwell Hudson, was helping me. And I had my tape recorder and I wanted to interview some people. So I was lucky enough to interview Butterfly McQueen, who had starred in Gone with the Wind. There's Lee Whipper with the whiskers. He was the oldest black actor. I interviewed him at age 99. And then John Henry Clark and others that I had the occasion, I've just found those interviews and had them digitized. <clears throat> what is the history makers? What did I start on my dining room table at the age of 40? Um, not having no kids and 
thinking at a time you'll get to a point in your life if you're not there, you think about what is gonna be your leave behind? What are you gonna leave for society? And that's when the, it came to me, the name. And uh, we're a 501c3, as Peter mentioned. Um, we are the largest collection of video oral history interviews. We're housed since 2016 at the Library of Congress, which is, serves as our permanent repository. We're in the largest facility for AV material built anywhere in the world. David Packard, he loves moving images and we love David Packard. Um, and our, our collection has actually been piped by 75 miles of fiber optic people downtown. How do we define a history maker? We define them as someone who's African American by descent, who's made significant accomplishments for his or her own life. And then the scholars came in to ask us uh, to also interview people who are associated with the particular movement organization of then and time that were important to the African American community. From the beginning, we've had 15 different categories. From even fashion, beauty, and military, and entertainment, and sports, to subjects where we're well represented with education, civics, and media, and even business. Our goal was to, to talk about the whole breadth of the Black community. This chart shows on the left-hand side, you know, things got rough in 2009 when we almost went out of business. But the collection is, but we were always trying to roll cameras and we're video, not just audio, but video it was very important to me that people would be able to see the people that were being discussed. The early, earliest recollection goes back to the 1700s. Um, we've done interviews in 413 cities and towns. The youngest at the time of interview was, was Aisha Millen, a prima ballerina. And our oldest at the time of interview was 109, 114 at the time of death. Louisiana Hines was a Rosie the World War II, Rosie the Ripper. We have less women than men, even though this is a project led by a woman and of a certain age, it was hard to get black women to sit down and talk. And recently Ursula Burns, who was the first black CEO of the, uh, in this country has just gifted us money to help start correcting that. The chart um, here to uh, the right, I want you to pay attention to this because almost 900 of our history makers have passed away. Um, if you look at 70 and above, that represents two thirds of the collection. The thing that started to concern me was that almost, almost no one in our collection has a repository for their papers. And our collection has people Lots of unsung people, but we have General Colin Powell and Harry Belafonte and Maya Angelou and Whoopi Goldberg and the list go and Barack Obama when he was Illinois State Senator. So our time is running out. And I love this here because Andrew Young's sister-in-law gave me that photo and I told her I love that photo because these are all the, what we call the Atlanta Civil Rights Mafia. We were all presidential Medal of Freedom recipients. In the, in, the, in the center is Reverend Joseph Lowry. He was the, the chief partner of Martin, Reverend Martin Luther King. He was the first to die during COVID. And then to the, to the left gives me the chills because there's C.T. Vivian to the far left. He and John Lewis died the same day. Uh, John, he in the morning, John Lewis in the evening. To the far right is, is Hank Aaron who um, baseball legend who died a week after his COVID shot that only leaves Andy Young, who Ambassador Andrew Young, who just turned 90 years old this year. Our time is running out. We actually lost a total of 135 people just in the last two years. I say that because what is debate being debated in society right now? Who has value and who doesn't? You preserve what has value. You throw away what doesn't. Society, so here we see the Rockefellers and the Whitney's, and you know, uh, we, we've talked about John Paul Getty and his, his massive collection. And, um, and where the question is, where does the Black experience fit during, in, in all of that? 
I started to, and the other thing I started to see as I was starting to work on this collection, especially the last 10 years, is that while we were doing this work, what became very, very apparent is our nation's libraries and museums and archives were, had a paucity of material about the Black experience. There's Washu, when I asked the, the archivists there, um, and they have a major collection, the Henry Hampton collection, but when I asked her over in the, you know, the manuscripts, what they had, she was a little embarrassed when she sort of popped up and said that they have the largest collection of Black Samuel. You have the University of um, Virginia special collections where they actually have documented how you apply Blackface. Um, then um, Harvard University, these are unidentified, the Seven Sisters, even though at one point you're going to have two Black people attending colleges and universities, but they're invisible to the university. And then I want to point out the Army Heritage Center, which is really partnering us. They have 25 million for digitization. 25 million. They can control all of the military museums. But when I asked who they had African-American collection, they had one, Benjamin O'Davis Sr. We've since gotten them, Togo West, who was secretary of the army under President Clinton. And I would say they're an active partnership with us. This other, the same numbers are, are poor at the nation's library of medicine. Uh, they have six African-Americans, although they have two football fields of material. So, that's one fact. The other fact is this less than 1% of our history makers have saved their papers. So about six years ago, I started to try to match people. So I happened to be finishing Angela Davis's interview. She didn't have plans. I've been talking to this messenger that made a match. And so that's her repository. Same thing happened with Jesse Norman. No one had asked her for her papers, opera legend, brought contacted the Librarian of Congress, the Music Librarian, we all met at Justin Norman's, and the rest is history. Tom Burrell, who represents the largest Black advertising agency in the country, having, having after heard a speak, found Duke University, um, where he is the only Black person in that collection that is the largest collection for advertising in the United States. My poster child, though. Nikki Giovanni, <clears throat> poet extraordinary. But at age 28, Howard Gottlieb of Boston University approached her to ask her to, for them to be the repository. It's extraordinary because every year for 47 years, she's been sending her collection there methodically. And she had the presence of mind for her because she didn't want to be concerned she asked at age 28 that it be sealed until after her lifetime. So it didn't matter when she dies what people care or think or say about her, but the collection there is quite amazing. Not digitized, but quite amazing. My progress has been slow because I thought, you know, I'm a graduate as I said of, I thought I said of Harvard Law School. And I, six years ago, I found that the law school only had two black people in its collection. We've been working. They, it's not because of them, we've been working. So I, we had identified Charles Ogletree who now um, has Alzheimer's. And, um, but he was the person who represented Anita Hill and the Clarence Thomas and Anita Hill parents. And he had 500 boxes. And what is pretty wonderful is that I think we're soon to get Anita gift. And then there's Randall Robinson who was the famed person behind the, the nation's um, nonprofit, Trans Africa, who helped in the freeing of, of South Africa. And so, but he's still in St. Kitts counting every piece of paper. And so our solution, because what is if these numbers are so small and the, and the progress is so slow, we're in a crisis of enormous proportions. And the only way we're gonna change it is that we use technology to do so. And that's where digital transitions came in. So I've been talking to 
Marilyn Dunn, formerly head of the, the um, Schlesinger Library, and I had formed a digitization committee. Um, she's, she was part of it, Bernie Riley at the Center for Research Libraries, Howard Dodson, for, a director emeritus of the Schomburg Center, and Dan Johnson, who has played an amazing role as our <clears throat> consulting archivist. Digital transitions stepped forward first um, to digitize um, 6, 20,000 images. Holocaust Museum, they developed, they donated our coding framework. Indiana University donated the digitization of AV material. They're the only university in the country where 30 million has been dedicated to the digitization of the entire AV corpus. And so it's with this small band of people that I'm sitting here today, very proud of what we've accomplished in less than a year. This is Eva Moulton Barnett. I had interviewed her. I actually studied about her when I was a student at the New York Schomburg Library doing that research. She was the second best in Porgy and Bess on Broadway. The first Porgy and Bess, the first Bess was Ann Brown, who had moved to Norway in 1937 and married an Olympic ski champion. <clears throat> um, so she lived to 103. Her daughter is alive at 101. Her, her granddaughter is 70. And this last summer, like all of a sudden I heard, started hearing about this estate sale. And I didn't want to go to the estate sale. I went to the estate sale because, and then I had a meltdown because people were literally just taking things off the walls. I mean, it was, I couldn't believe it. I'm okay with furniture, jewels, not okay with people's personal papers and their, and their photographs. <clears throat> and this formed the basis of what is now our digital library. So what it represents for us is that we already have the interviews. Our interviews average uh, three to five hours in length. The largest interview in our collection is 15 hours. Um, and then we have extreme amount of metadata. Everything's transcribed, everything indexed, very, a large focus on taxonomy and metadata. Um, and then the thought was, we really could do the right thing if we could digitize people's papers. It's really expensive though. But, and so I wanna show you just real, real, real quickly before um, we, you know, I just wanna show you a few things in the interest of time. I wanna make sure that I'm on, on time, but this is our digital archive and you have brochures that you were given that show our digital archive. This was created by Carnegie Mellon. It's an extraordinary collaboration of a university working with a small nonprofit for 20 years with almost no funding from us. It's this what they, so if you see here and I'll have um, a we'll type in digitization that seems to be appropriate for today. <clears throat> No stories found, okay. And you'll see that six stories come up. In fact, the first one is the noted scholar, Skip Gates, as you know him from Finding Your Roots. And he's giving this wonderful description about his family history. Um, and he's talking about that this, a lot of things couldn't be determined before the, the, the use of digitization for people's papers. I thought that pretty, I just found that this morning and I thought that pretty wonderful um, that, that that's there. <clears throat> our collection, everything in our collection is transcribed. Everything is digitized, even the initial analog material that we had. Um, and we go through with this digital archive and separate, separate things as if they are chapters of a book. Um, if we, so you see here, um, you can search here with their abstracts written um, for every, and then their chapters. And then we have a list form if you don't wanna read that, that you can go through and look at the list. And there's also a map version that's there. We, if you, um, if you wanted, to, you know, let's say you wanted to find someone with the name O. And, oh, sorry. If you wanted to find someone with the name O 
And, um, but you didn't know exactly where to find them, but let's say his name is Barack Obama there, um, <laughs> which we interviewed when he was um, an Illinois state senator. And um, I can't play it for you, but it's a really wonderful clip. And you find out how consistent he is with his messaging, even back then. Um, <clears throat> And there's a lot of um, work that we've done on metadata, but if I wanted to save that clip, I could save it into my clips. And then when I go search, it'll come up. I wanna point uh, just one other thing on here, which is the topic search, because we had gathered, um, the archivists start telling, asking me, what are you gonna do? This is keyword searchable, but what are you gonna do about things that are inferred that are not stated? And so we had a group of 10 graduate students almost a decade, decade ago over a summer, and they human tagged and coded um, using this coding tree, um, 400 interviews. But practically speaking, I mean, when we're, when we're gonna get back to that kind of work. And so we used artificial intelligence here and literally the whole corpus Thank you, thank you, thank you. The whole corpus was um, indexed um, in two week period. And so we're very pleased with the use of AI and also machine learning because AI on its own will not completely work when the community is missing. And so here we put in schools and discrimination and we have 603 results that are based on the theme, on those themes coming together. But there's no, there's no tag to show the words because these are all things that are inferred. So what is the work that we did? And Hannah will talk more about the work on, on um, digital transitions um, and pixel beauty side. But we had always asked people to bring photos with them and have, we had them narrate them. And they're actually on the digital archive that we're going through. And I think there are like 40,000 images we're going through. But we, in this particular case, um, because I have people, lots of people who are passing away, who have papers, but they don't know their value and don't even know why it's valuable. So we took Adam Moten's papers and um, literally um, DT has done an amazing job. That's all I can say. <laughs> so this is a letter. These are people who had fine lives. Um, her husband, um, um, Claude Barnett was head of the Associated Negro Press. So this is a letter from President Eisenhower in 1958. Um, they traveled all over. He was a strong Africanist. Uh, but one of the things we did is we took the scrapbooks. Oh, I, I want to show this photo, photo here. Because um, Adam Moten is from, um, from Texas, and Texas had landholding blacks. Their history goes back they, there and Florida. And look at this beautiful photograph. Um, and I want to show the inscription on the back. It's the Moton family, and the Moton's are the ones that are the Tuskegee Airmen, as you've heard of Tuskegee Airmen. It says Los Angeles, 1915, the Reverend Freeman Moton, Ida, the mother, and Etta G, age 14, that November. At that time, they could little imagine that she would go on to be a world-class um, operatic star. Um, but we took the scrapbooks, and I want to show you these. Um, because they're really beautiful. I will never take apart scrapbooks ever again in life. <laughs> because scrapbooks tell a story, right? And um, so in here are, you know, their, their, their story. I love this image, you know, I don't know who it is. In fact, what we're gonna be doing is getting uh, the 101 granddaughter, the granddaughter on and the state seller on the phone to help over now that these are digitized to help identify the people in the photo. And I'll just have her show some of these uh, to you um, because this is, so that's Eva and that's 
the Edisu, they like Edda, 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 Su, 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 Edda. They like that in the family. I love this photo here, you know, black people dressed up in all their finery, right, you know, in front of the railroad train as part of the great migration coming from the south to the north. Um, uh, that's, that's right there at Tuskegee, um, which has a very important archive and where um, Pod Barnett was very much associated with it. Literally, the family had 150 years of perfectly preserved history that sort of got torn asunder that day. I, I want to, oh, this is Jesse Norman. Uh, I mean, no, Jesse Owen, sorry, famous track stars uh, standing right next to Anna and her finery. But I want to, I wanna, um, before I bring Hannah to the stage, I want to end by um, saying one thing, a couple things. When I was in that classroom at age nine, I was ashamed of my enslaved history. I didn't feel like I had a history to call my own when everybody had one. I am no longer ashamed of those Black people who came through because I consider them absolutely amazing. And in, their, in, their, in my veins runs their blood. The other thing I want to say is early in the, in the, in the, in the project, because my name is not Oprah Winfrey or Steven Spielberg, who did the Shoah Foundation project. And, and I was trying to balance off well-known and unsung. And in the early years, we did Negro baseball and players, Pullman Porters, and Tuskegee Airmen. And one day I was going to interview Colonel Bill Thompson, who was a noted Tuskegee Airman. And I was thinking, why am I going to interview him? No one knows him. And I showed up and he had boxes and boxes that are the materials in, now in the Air and Space Museum, the Tuskegee Airmen Museum in Detroit. And he sat me down and he said, have you heard of the Golden 13? I said, no, Colonel Thompson, I've never heard of the Golden 13. He said they were the Navy's version of the Tuskegee Airmen. And there are four left living in this country. And one lives upstairs. And he wants to talk to you also. And that's when I knew that our project was about discovery. What I've learned over the years and the path that I'm on right now is discovery is not enough. We are on a rescue mission to, to, to preserve the history so it is permanent. So that, the, so that we can show the world the value of the Black experience. Thank you very much, and have a good Can everybody hear me? Yes. Okay. I just just bear with me just a moment or two while. Ziv puts this over. Um, I guess we could grab a question if anyone has one while we're flipping over a deck here. Is anything up first? So 22 years later, what would uh, today's version tell you uh, when you started in 2000? If you didn't know that, I mean, your version of the world you could have talked to yourself 22 years. If I could talk to myself 22 years ago, um, I didn't know that what the path that I had embarked upon was so needed. I knew that, I didn't even know that during my lifetime that the work would be recognized. Um, and um, 
I don't know because it's been, you know, money has always been an issue. So I don't know if I can really answer that objectively because it's all so close right now as I stand here. That's, that's what I'm talking about. Okay, another question. Yes. Hi, Julianne. I'm yeah. Allison Rose Jefferson. So a little later. Yeah. So um, I was just curious in terms of where you all are right now with the archive. Okay, so um, Etta had, I don't know how much stuff, but how much stuff can you digitize well, okay. for an interview? Well, no, we the, literally digital transitions digitized all that material, including the use of AI, which Hannah will talk about in, I think, a month's time. And um, we also, I need to be clear about it, we do not want to be a physical repository. We'll work with physical repositories. We only want to digitize them. What I can tell you is during COVID, we were one of the few archives open um, with our digital archive. And, and um, and so it would cost to do 20 boxes. If each of our history makers just had 20 boxes, it would be $400 million. It's hugely expensive. If I can save 30%, some kind of way, um, we will be successful. And if I can incentivize the nation's libraries, museums, and archives to be partners, and we can use students, to go in and help code and research. Not only are we taking people inside the lives of Black people, but we will, we will raise the, so, the cultural and social equity of the Black community at the same time. Thank you, thank you Juliana. We'll, I'm sure we'll have some more questions after uh, Hannah's part of the presentation. So as you all heard from Juliana, these are vital narratives that are worth preserving. And one of the biggest challenges that we had was digitizing these personal collections. Through these ephemera, we were able to provide valuable, visible context to these narratives. So personal collections are frequently overlooked because they tend to be messy, less organized, and can contain extraneous information, where they also provide vital fragments of people's lives and stories. Gathering metadata for a collection can be time consuming and labor intensive, often involving the individual knowledge and experience of one single person. Without this identifying descriptive metadata, valuable information can be lost and collections can remain incomplete. AI or artificial intelligence can be used as part of a metadata workflow to reduce the cost and tediousness of enriching a collection with enhanced metadata records. So as you heard from Juliana's presentation, we took a digitize first, process second approach in order to surmount this difficulty of obtaining metadata collection information. The pilot project for this digitization project was from the Etta Merton and Claude Barnett personal collection. And this consisted of several scrapbooks as well as photographic prints, correspondence, newspapers, and newspaper clippings relating to their lives. One of the biggest things that we had to do before we could actually digitize the collection was making it, as we call in the business, camera ready. So that essentially required some certain level of organization, a box structure, a folder structure, some sort of thematic quantity without going into a full depth processing and cataloging component. So when we received the collections at our facility, we did an in-depth physical discovery of the materials. We then needed to think about, with this initial pilot, how we wanted to deal with future history of those collections looking towards the future, creating adaptable naming conventions and determining file formats and AI applications that will have greater uses and implications with future collections and material types. So first and foremost, we wanted to create high quality images. So we used a DT phase one IX solution to produce the highest quality digital images possible and gather as much information as we could from the image. So along with imaging the fronts and backs of photographs, we were able to capture captions containing pertinent information along with the photographic prints themselves. We also imaged each page of the scrapbooks and then cropped into each individual photograph and clipping to capture the greatest amount of information and detail possible for each item. 
We then implemented a multivariant processing pipeline to quickly and efficiently produce as many deliverables as requested by the client. By partnering with the history makers to digitize and analyze these personal collections, we created optical character recognition or OCR transcription records and provided object and notable person detection recognition through the use of AI. This allowed us to assist in the telling of these seminal stories by providing enhanced digital assets and metadata in order to promote accessibility, prompt research, and provide valuable visible context. So one of the most impactful things that we do in digital preservation is create open access to these collections, such as those belonging to the history makers. Another way to augment this accessibility and promote research within a collection is through searchable text which can be generated from these high quality digital images that our mass digitization approach produces. So for this project, optical character recognition allowed us to provide enhanced searchable digital assets, as well as a transcription record of the documents, both typed and handwritten within the collection. So not only were we able to provide transcription for printed letters, memos, and clippings, but also handwritten captions and messages that were in the collection. We were also able to improve the accuracy of the software by implementing language hints, which allowed us to refine its capabilities, making the transcription even more precise. This OCR text was delivered in a variety of formats, including plain text, JSON, Alto XML, and HOCR. And this allowed the history makers to determine which option would be the most beneficial for the newly created online platform. Having this transcribed text allowed the history makers to improve access to the collection as well as keyword searchability through their own platform. We also conducted in-depth image analysis of the items. So we conducted both object detection and notable person detection within this collection. So there were two different methodologies for this image analysis of notable person detection. There was notable individual detection and custom trained facial recognition. So for notable individual detection, this is based on an existing database of faces of notable people. And this is very helpful if you don't know exactly who's going to be in the collection. It's kind of great at discovering notable people that you didn't know would be there, but it's not infallible. It does tend to skew towards particularly affluent Caucasian celebrities within the last hundred years or so, which is where the custom training model can become beneficial. Another potential thing to make note of with notable individual detection is that because it's searching such a wide database, at this point probably within the seven figures, the likelihood of a false positive or an identification that's misidentified as another individual is not uncommon, which is where implementing a confidence threshold like we did here can be helpful because it provides a sort of certainty threshold of the software's confidence in its identification as well as a flag for those conducting quality control and reviewing the materials. The custom trained model, however, means that the person doesn't have to be famous, doesn't have to be notable, but we do have to manually label a few photos of the person. So with the notable person detection, you're able to identify people that are recognizable with medium or high confidence such as Hatta Brooks or Thomas A. Dorsey. With the custom trained facial recognition, we were able to train the software to recognize both Etta and Claude, two people that we expected to be in the collection. And we did this simply by putting their names into the software along with their images at the beginning of the process. This allowed us to identify them among many people or on their own within the images. It looks like one of my slides is missing, so I will just uh, talk to you about one more step, which is called date inferencing. So one of the ways that refining the AI software's notable person detection capabilities is creating a date range for what you expect to find within a certain collection. So in this case, because we anticipated that the collection would follow along the lifespan of Etta Moten and the images and the people that we anticipated finding in the collection, we set parameters to exclude people who were born after the 1960s. This essentially allowed us to minimize the potential for false positives and increase the precision of the software. But these data parameters can also be used in different ways. Although we didn't do this for this particular collection, another potential use of AI is the ability to infer dates that photographs or images were taken 
based on the ages of the people in the photographs. So the implications for this in the cultural heritage world are astronomical. So essentially we can estimate a person's age in a given photograph and use that information to extrapolate the date when the photo was taken. So if it's a notable individual and we know the person's birth date, we can infer the approximate date for the photo. So if, for example, we know that Etta Moten was born in 1901 and we identify that she is 25 in the photograph, we can then approximate that the photo was taken in 1926. With this same principle, if the other same person appears in two photographs and the date of one of them is known, we can infer the date of the other. So if, for example, we had that photograph of Etta Moten when she was 14, and we knew that that was in, let me do some quick math, 1915, and then we identified her in a photograph five years later, we could infer when that photograph had been taken. We can also utilize custom facial recognition to identify ages, as there was a question about this in Doug's presentation. So if you were to take images of Etta Moten from different ages in the collection at the age of say 14, 34, 15, 60, you'd then be able to identify her throughout all of those ranges and identify any changes to her facial symmetry that may have occurred through the aging process. So the questions that we have to ask ourselves are why now, why digitize, and why utilize AI? The significance of this particular program lies in the fact that it is telling the stories of individuals who might otherwise have been overlooked in the historical canon and lost over time. Physical collections provide tangible mementos of the past and valuable reminders of not just personal stories, but also collective memory and lived experiences. However, just like memories can fade, physical collections are subject to degradation over time. And that's why it's so imperative to preserve them, and with that, preserve the vital narratives that make up the past. Digitization captures these materials and moments in time, revitalizing physical collections and their stories and making them more accessible. Artificial intelligence is yet one more way of enhancing these historical records and gathering valuable information before it's lost over time. And with that, I will bring Juliana back up here and we'll answer some questions. Thank you, thank you, ma'am. Uh, questions? Hi, I have a question for the panel. Oh. Do you share a little more about the database? You can just put that on the so we actually utilized a number of different APIs to sort of refine our AI model. Uh, it's a proprietary AI model that uses a general database, and then we implemented actually both that and custom face training for this project. What I want to emphasize, though, with AI is that we, it, oh, sorry, no, you're fine, go ahead. It'll have to be a combination of AI and a machine and assistive uh, learning. Just it's there's not enough. The database is not inclusive in that way, and there are a lot of people that um, that are not recognized. That's why I want to work with the family. I've been telling our history makers that they need to take care of their legacy the way they would take care of their wills. And so there's a lot of education that we have to do here, but the, having this prototype will go a long way um, to at least people being able to visualize. You can't tell stories without the visual representation of the stories. And you can't, you know, we have people's stories, but we don't, you know, have aside from the things that we have people bring to us. And I guess, you know, back to your question, I was trying to think about um, what I would have done differently. I mean, money was, as I said, money was always an issue. We looked for technology that was really important. Um, I think um, that technology is absolutely, absolutely critical. And I'm not even sure the advances that we see now were not present 22 years ago when I started. Excellent. Um, more, more questions?
Uh, are you doing everything start to finish? Like, I, when you go and meet with these families or individuals, and you come across all of this, uh, all these boxes of things that need to be saved, are you then also going and finding uh, like a landing place for all this stuff? At well, okay. Are you pushing okay. the actual family to go out and do that. No. I mean, I'm at the end of the day, I'm only interested in the digital images. I'm interested in them coming to us, going to DT, going back, and then back to the family. If they're, I'm working now with Columbia University on a collection, and it was, this has been a very interesting sort of test case. This is, I can't talk about who the person is, but he's quite prominent. And um, I had, I had been instrumental. He didn't even care about archives at all or putting his papers in any place. So on his deathbed, he said to his wife that that was important that I, you know, he follow uh, what I had been suggesting. And so I got with the archivist at Columbia and we went to meet with the family. And he said, you know, uh, we're not gonna, we're not gonna we, we, it will take us a long time to digitize. Just let her digitize it out there and then it can come to us. And so those kinds of collaborations are important, but remember there's a lot of education that has to go on. Um, there's education of the general populace because they may not know something's valuable. There was someone here in, in LA, very, very prominent, person in the entertainment industry. I wanted him, I convinced him that UCLA was the place to put his papers, but there's just a lack of knowledge about who's who in our black community. And so, so there's education on both sides, but I think it would be too, really too much to be trying that soup to, soup to nuts. One of the things I wanna say, because I have a legal background, all of our history makers sign releases. And so we own like 100% of it. Now, I believe and have always operated under ethics policy, a strong ethics policy, um, which I don't, yeah, anyway, I just, I believe in a strong ethics policy. But um, because if people entrust you, and I would say the one thing that we did right is that if we tell someone they should go here, um, they pretty much listened to us. Jesse Norman said it immediately. Angela Davis said immediately. Um, you know, there are other significant people like we're talking to Eartha Kitt and her family, you know, her daughter. Um, but I think we earned the trust over time because people were observing and seeing, but no, we could not take on all of that. It's, it's not practical. We have a collection that should, is coming to us and it was... Um, there's some a man. There was a, a John. We in Chicago were known by Johnson, so there was Ebony Johnson, which is a very significant collection. And I don't know if you know, heard, um, have heard about the Ebony um, Johnson Publishing Collection that almost went in bankruptcy to be torn asunder. But uh, the the Mellon Foundation, the Ford Foundation, um, MacArthur. Um, the, the Getty and the National African American Museum all banded together, there are 5 million images. And um, they're all gonna be saved and digitized, which was a miracle save. But here we have 3,400 people, very prominent in the black community, that if we can also save some part of that, we, we have a tremendous ability to help change the narrative of black achievement in this country by real events not fictionalized accounts of what happened. Yep. Juliana, we have a, or, Juliana and Hannah, we have a question. For oh, sorry. Oh, hey. uh, question for Juliana is how do you go about creating partnership with universities or archive institutions? So I, we would not be around without those partnerships. So two very important partnerships, Association of Moving Image Archivists. I was in, we started, doing interviews in February of 2000. By November, I'm here in LA, um, meeting with the Association of Moving Image Archivists. They were extremely helpful to us. Um, the other thing is um, universities are really important. And I have to give a shout out to the University of Illinois and especially um, their former president, B. Joseph White, who um, gifted us a million dollars, not in money, but in fellowships. 
And they have a world-class library school who really experimented with us. We didn't know we were being experimented with. But we have not only EAD finding aids, we have EAC CPF finding aids. So we were advanced in a lot of ways that we didn't realize. So by the time we get to the Library of Congress, they're saying like, <laughs> you're doing this. And actually in the Library of Congress, we were their experimentation with born digital. So half of the collection up to 2009 is analog, the rest of it is born digital, but they had never handled a born digital collection. Now a PBS is coming in with its collection and so they're more experienced. And so that was a learning curve. Partnerships, we, so we grew outside the academy and people did not know what to do with us. And frankly, I'm a lawyer by training. So people didn't know what to do with me, a lawyer by training who had a home shopping network someplace. So they were like totally like, who is this person? But at the same time, there was no way that we could do this without partnerships. And I'm a big believer. I mean, universities, now we're in 168 colleges and universities with our digital archive. They're now using in the classroom. Uh, the Getty became our first museum partner. They're using it for cur cur the, their curatorial staff. I mean, this is sort of a dream, but still we need, to, there's a lot to do. And it cost us 30 million to build the collection, each interview $6,000. But everything has to be, now we have to re-digitize. And I was talking at, at, um, to dis, yeah, at breakfast about how the, you know, like it's really expensive. We're having to re-digitize the whole collection. Video you have to re-digitize every three to five years. It's very complicated. I maybe that's the thing. I did not know the video was so complicated. I did not know that. <laughs> okay, any more questions? Uh, next question is, uh, as you dealt with information from personal papers or stories that require redaction or special treatment, have you had to deal with it at all in the process? Yeah, okay. So like 99.9% .9 of our subjects have never done an oral history interview. So they, a lot of times don't even really know and I'm explaining them at the time of the interview, what we are and we do not, we do not edit. Um, and we used to be very like maniacal, like we would not edit. Um, and we do a lot of work in terms of opening people up. One of the questions I've made mandatory is what sights and smells and sounds remind you of your childhood, because we're trying to bring people back to a point of memory. But um, we have, we are not, we are not a news gathering organization. We're not a got you organization. So we're not running cameras. That's unethical. We're not running cameras when someone says that we are offline. Okay, and we want to be respectful. Um, we have, so we have, there was one instance that, um, well, we ended up not editing anything, but there was one instance where this, uh, one of our history makers said he was going to be sued by his family and he had regretted doing the interview and he had gotten too loose and da, da, da. I didn't know what he was talking about, but on his deathbed, he came with his son to look at the interview and all was well with the world. I do want to say though, on one thing, we have, there are people we have taken out of the collection. There's Frederick Douglass IV. Frederick Douglass didn't have offspring, so he could not have a fourth. So we found he was lying. There was a Negro baseball league player that we found when we started to like process his interview, we couldn't fact check, things weren't making sense. He had to go. So there, <laughs> so, so you know, we, you know, oral history is based on memory, but I mean, we are, it's not based on falsehood. So, so those are the things that, you know, are important to us. It's important that we have um, a collection of this primary source material. And we want the scholars, we see ourselves in partnerships with scholars that they will come you know, and help us get things right and fact check and correct. What I can tell you is that there are things in there you cannot find any other place you know, in, in, in um, scholarship right now. Thank you. Any, any more questions for this room? Because there are the online folks are done. 
Can, can I just say one other thing? I, I mean, I can't say enough about what this team has done for us. This is a new path for us. And it would not be possible, Peter, if you had not said yes to that name. It just would not be possible because the foundations, the funding community were telling me, oh no, like it's heresy. You cannot digitize first and process second. But I'll tell you the other day, and I told Peter this, I was ecstatic because I was on a call around an archive uh, with Harvard University Library. And they were saying that they are now digitizing first and processing second. So I think, you know, this is the thing, we don't have time. We're in a race against time. Our, uh, that, that chart that I showed you, two thirds of our collection, they are going out of here quickly. And with them, this is, a, this is a, what we say all the time, every death represents a library burning. So thank you very much.